because of the mask, uh, is, I have to wear it, okay? That's fine, okay. okay. All right, hello everybody, and welcome to another beautiful day here on Adventures with Sarah. Here in Seattle, it is uh, freezing cold and gray, but we're gonna take you somewhere sunnier today. I'm being joined by my friend, Jorge Roman, who is always the sunshine himself. So he, he, doesn't <laughs> oh. even, he doesn't even need to live in Spain. He's always the sunshine anyway. But today, Jorge's gonna uh, take us on a walk of his hometown. Uh, buenos dias, Jorge. Buenos dias to you. Buenas tardes here. How are you doing? Hello, everybody. and. Uh... Thank you for being here and taking your time to see this beautiful sunset that I have behind me over here. I will show it to you from the other camera at the back of the phone. So the temperature right now is not as cold as Seattle, but uh, it's about uh, eight Celsius. So that is about 44 Fahrenheit, uh, which is not that bad. Although last night we reached 20 Fahrenheit. Can you believe that? <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, that, that was Older quite cold. Yeah. <laughs> Cold. Anyway, so uh, guys, uh, we are in uh, where Madrid started. Madrid was nothing, nothing at all, uh, ten centuries ago, a bit more than ten centuries ago. And uh, first of all, I just want to thank you, Sarah, Sarah, again, so much for letting me have this uh, fantastic opportunity. You know, adventure with Sarah, just broadcasting this through your page. This is just fantastic. So uh, I forgot to say that. So please uh, forgive me about that. Anyway, we are in a place which is behind me. And uh, this is called the Square of the Emir, E-M-I-R. Emir is like the monarch, the king in the uh, Muslim uh, world. Okay. And uh, what was here in Madrid before Madrid? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Uh, the Iberian Peninsula was conquered by the Arabs in the year 711, and it took very few years, uh, just a matter of almost two and a half years, to conquer the entire Iberian Peninsula, uh, getting almost to the very northern stripe of the Iberian Peninsula, including Portugal, but today is Portugal, and a little bit of the uh, south of southeast of France. And uh, well, uh, they stayed here for almost 800 years. The last bastion conquered by the Catholic monarchs, Isabel and Fernando, was in 1492, and that was the Kingdom of Granada. So imagine, uh, that has left a very big uh, genetic imprint in our life and, you know, style, food, uh, everything. Well, focusing here in Madrid, let me just go to the other camera here, and you will see something which is the only remains of the Arabic period of Madrid. And look at this slide is absolutely fantastic. Guys, I'm going to wear my mask right now because it's compulsory uh, to wear the mask outdoors. And uh, in my, if my voice is a bit muffed, uh, now you understand uh, why it's like that. But anyway, this, what we see here, is the Muslim wall of the city of Madrid. As I said, nothing here at all. Who decided to establish something in Madrid, that wasn't called Madrid at the time, I'll let you know in a minute, the name, the original name. Well, uh, it had to be somebody that has some power in those uh, people that were conquering the Iberian Peninsula. And they decided this location just because of this view that we have in front of us. Look at that. It might not look like because of this building, but you have like about 120 degree angle of vision over here. That is west, as you see, and because of winter, you know, the axle of the earth changes uh, a little bit. That is the southwest, uh, and that is the way to Toledo. Uh, Toledo was very important in the Roman times and also was very important uh, in the Arabic times. But uh, uh, whoever decided to place that castle where we are right now is because of this point of view. You could see any enemy coming from the distance from here. And uh, as I said, this is the square dedicated to the emir in general, not to any specific one. And uh, these walls, there is a story behind these walls. Okay, let me tell you, Madrid. Madrid is, the original name is Magerit. M-A-G-E-R-I-T, Magerit. That means something like uh, where the water flows. Madrid is uh, also considered um, the second most capital city of the nation, greenest in the whole world after Tokyo. So if the water flows, it means that the city was built over water streams. And this wall has a little fantastic, beautiful history behind it. The enemy, the, in, in that case, the, the Christians, that they, went, they wanted to 
conquer the citadel uh, dominated by the Arabs, they used to say, Madrid is built over waters and is surrounded by walls of fire. And you're gonna say, oh, that sounds beautiful. What does it mean? Madrid, as I told you, means where the water flows. And these stones, they are made of flint. When do you think the enemies attacks the persons that, or the people that they want to attack at night? So imagine the Christian forces with arrows, just throwing them against the wall. And because it's made out of flint, the point of the arrows, they were iron. So they were sparkling when they were hitting the wall. So imagine at night with all this dark, just all those sparkling things. And it was just uh, scaring the enemy. That was one of the points. You know, so Madrid is a city built over waters and the walls are made out of fire. So here we are in this fantastic model. Con su permiso, señores, muchas gracias. <laughs> gracias. Uh, there was uh, a couple of uh, gentlemen just sitting here. All right, so guys, this is where we are exactly at this point. And look at this model. This is the building that we're going to see in a moment, which is the Cathedral of Madrid. There you are. So just to put you on situation. And that is the royal palace that we're going to see in a few minutes. Well, this was one of the entrances of the city coming from Toledo. As I told you, pointing southwest. Now, this is the cathedral, as I told you, but just this a representation of what it used to be the citadel. In this citadel, the Arabic citadel, they estimated that uh, there was uh, like about 5,000 people living in here because if the castle, that by the way, in Arabic you say al Qasar, A L Z A, uh, no, wait a minute, A L Z A C A R, al Qasar, okay? So if the al Qasar was right here in the highest peak of Madrid, which is where we are now, and the citadel was nearby, obviously, you know, those forces that they were going to the north of the country or to the south of the country, they had to sleep here somewhere. And he brought some people that just to sell like markets, everything. And it was just an overnight camp. What about this other wall that we see around here? Sometime around the late 900s, the Christian monarchs arrived to this part of the Iberian Peninsula and they conquered this site. They conquered Maharit. Uh, in one of those battles, what they did, they knocked down this wall. Okay, and they left only a very small portion, which is the one I showed you at the very beginning, those walls that were made out of fire, actually it's this portion that we see here. And they built what we call the 1200 city walls. This was a huge extension. If we are to walk from here to here, that is where the opera house is, nonstop is about three minutes. Nowadays, obviously, the sense of distance is not the same as it used to be in those days. So that was a huge enlargement of the city, you know, when it became Christian. So this is the very beginning of Madrid. And uh, look, you know, the sense of uh, heritage and uh, cultural issues uh, didn't exist in Spain in the 50s and 60s and 70s. That's why those blocks of apartments are built over the walls that probably they were knocked down just to make the uh, legs to hold those buildings. Anyway, let's go now <coughs> out of here. If uh, uh, this gentleman with the dog allowed us, uh, thank you, muchas gracias. Okay, so look at the, oh, look at that. Wait a minute, I just wanna see if I can do a zoom here. Isn't that glorious? Look at that, how beautiful that sunset is. Okay. Let's go back to our original route. And uh, here we are. This is the Cathedral of Madrid. That uh, I have to say, I am a frustrated architect. I did three years of architecture uh, many years ago, and I found out it's not my thing. This architecture doesn't really appeal to me. This is the back part of the cathedral. And uh, this, uh, as you see, it has two different stones. The, part that you see over there, which is built over the main altar and above the crypt, which is that white part in there, that was uh, started to be built in the late 1800s. But in that uh, period of time, Spain was extremely involved in guerrilla wars all over the world, South Pacific, Africa, and also in America. 
with all the countries that uh, they got their independence. And obviously, it was a political problem more than a monetary problem because, you know, those colonies, they were getting their independence. And obviously, the war took all the money, all the wars. Continuing at the hill of these streets where we are in a straight line, we get to the core of the city. But as I told you, there's going to be a little bit of a religious issue, which is showing you the cathedral already finished and the uh, royal palace. That the royal palace is the last royal palace built in Spain. Uh, there used to be three royal palaces in Madrid. Now there's only two. One is here in front of us, we're going to see in a few minutes, and the other is in the southern part of the city, in a town called Aram. Well, well, this is the cathedral, and as you see, two different stones. So the stops worked for several times. And as you see in this statue that we see here, he's Jean Paul II, that he came to consecrate the cathedral himself in 19. 93. And believe me, guys, <laughs> this is true. They were working on the cathedral. Happened till the night before he arrived to consecrate the cathedral. So they finished their works with a hurry. And that's why, you know, the mix of uh, styles to me doesn't appeal. Don't get me wrong, please. I don't mean to say that the house of God is ugly, not at all. It's just the style. This is the side entrance of the cathedral if you want to visit. And the main door is just around the corner. While we get there, just let me show you all these apartments that we have here with all these trees and gardens. These are residential apartments. If you ask me how much one of these apartments in here could be, I honestly will tell you, I don't care. <laughs> you know, they must be so expensive. Um, but it all depends on the services that uh, you might get with them. Well, look what we have there. Look at that distance. That is the Royal Palace. But just uh, before focusing to the Royal Palace, I'm just going to show you here, this corner. Look, this is what I was telling you about the style of the cathedral. Doesn't appeal to me. And especially now, the front facade that we're going to see in a moment. Uh, the columns means nothing to me. Uh, also, the towers, I mean, is magnificent in size, it's huge, it's so big. But as I said, the style does not really appeal to me at all. Even here, we can perceive that the central nave is different stones as they are here. If I just show you this part and I tell you, hey, look at this uh, office building, you might believe me, but no, it's just a wing of the cathedral. And here we are at the Royal Palace. Look at how beautiful it is. This was commissioned to be built by the first of the Bourbon monarchs in 1736. What happened with the previous one? Okay, the previous one was a consequence of an extension, several extensions of that Al Castle, that Arabic castle I told you at the very beginning. And uh, what a coincidence. And when I say what a coincidence, I say it like this, what a coincidence that in the uh, year 1734, when all the pieces of art of the royal collection was out of the palace because the palace was supposed to be renewed and restored, the palace burned down to ashes, the old one. Hold on a second, I'm gonna put my hand through the fence and then you can see. Here you are, the palace, in case you want to take a screenshot. And I'm going to do a little zoom here if I can. Yes, there you see. So uh, the original project of this was from uh, Sacchetti, an Italian architect. And uh, his pupil, Giovara, was the one in charge to follow with all the works. Two years after the beginning of the construction of this uh, palace in, uh, that started in 1736, uh, Yuvara had a word with the monarch and said, you know, uh, the budget is going out of our hands and uh, we, we need to do something. We have to reduce the budget. Okay, let's reduce the budget. What can you do? I said, well, I can reduce it to a fifth of the size of it. A fifth? Oh my goodness, that's going to be a little small in the past, I think. Well, but you know, money 
Okay, let's do a fifth. Uh, guess how many rooms there are now, being a fifth of the original project? 2,800 rooms. This is the largest royal palace in Europe. I mean, the Buckingham Palace, with all my respects for the royal British royal family, is like uh, the little garden house or, you know, backyard shed compared in size to this one. But uh, if you ever decide to come over to Madrid, uh, I just uh, don't don't feel panic. You're gonna you are allowed only to visit 19 of the rooms where part of the royal collection is kept in here. We are a monarchy, yes, but the king doesn't rule at all the country. We are a constitutional monarchy or parliamentary monarchy, and uh, it's just a figurehead. It's not I am against or in favor of the royalty. It's that I just consider them like uh, just to be the representatives of our country. It's a very expensive uh, uh, public relationships. That's how I consider them. So over there, when you see behind the, that fence over there, the skyline, that is the largest park. Nowadays, it's public park of the city of Madrid, that, which is called Casa de Campo. Casa de Campo means the country house and used to belong to the royalty. And it was their private hunting grounds. So imagine how powerful was the monarchy at the time. Being 2,800 rooms, obviously, you know, it's not only because uh, the royalty needed all those rooms, it's because uh, the amount of people around the royalty that it was needed when they had to uh, move from one section of the uh, palace to the other. Yeah? They have a, let's have a here with that beautiful skyline there and that beautiful light. And oh, look at the lights are coming up on the cathedral. So there you see, that is the facade. And let's walk, let's go. Now we're going to go to the side of Royal Palace that it might look to you if you don't, if you haven't seen it before, like the front uh, facade of the palace. It is not, it's just the side and it's the length of it. So we have seen the patio of uh, the guards, and this is all the area where used to be traffic going over this uh, square that we're gonna go about in a minute, about 25 years ago. But uh, they made a mac macro project in here just to bury all the traffic. There is a bus hub down below our feet. There's also a road with all the traffic. So they spent loads of money in the late 80s here to reconvert on all these things, pedestrian park. And uh, I'm gonna cross the street over here because I want you to see that the palace does not finish here in this corner. It continues down there, you see? And look, it's massive. It's, I mean, it's so big. And it was the very first palace ever built in, uh, in Spain that wasn't done in uh, timber because that is exactly what happened to the other palace. It was made out of uh, wood everywhere, carpets, etc. So it was very, you know, flammable. So they wanted to avoid that. And there is a lot of beams. And as you see, I'm gonna try and make it zoomy here. Look. Right there. We can see some statues, can we? But the others are not statues. But then at some strategic points, we see some other statues. Normally they are by coat of arms, also halfway through up the beams. Here you have one, there's another one over here. Well, that is a collection of 114 statues that they were supposed to be placed, all of them together at the end of each beam. So there were statues at the end of well, each beam. The very first monarch that lived in here was Charles III. And that was in the second half of the 1700s. He was walking around one of those days and in a windy day, one of those statues just simply fell in front of him. And he said, ooh, ooh, this is not safe. We have to do something. So they anchored some of them, some strategic ones just by the coat of arms and the rest, they were split around in the city. But uh, initially they were kept in the, municipality uh, warehouses. It was uh, Isabel Segunda, like a century later, uh, that she discovered them and she decided to spread them around in the city. Now, that collection of 114, some are here, 
Some others are spread, spread around the city of Madrid, and 14 of those are in Navarra. Sara, you know Navarra very well because of our friend Francisco Gladia, right? In Pamplona. So why 14 of them in Navarra? Well, let me tell you one thing. Look, this is the very first one because they are in chronological order. His name is Ataulfo, and that means in old Spanish, dead at the in the year 415. Okay, so this was the very first monarch from the Visigoths when they came from Central Europe to the Iberian Peninsula after the fall of the Roman Empire. Let's follow the line here. We have the next one, Eurico, dead on the year 484, and so on. So there is, in this walk, there are 10 statues. Let's pan to our left, and in the distance, we're going to see like a twin walk. In the other side of the square, look at them, and we see another two statues, one here and another here. So there's a total of 10 over there and a total of 10 where I am now. So you see, that's where I am. But what about those 14 that they are in Navarra? That is because those monarchs, and that is covering a period from the year 415, as we saw here, up until the Catholic monarchs, okay? When they married and they unified what today is Spain. Uh, 14 of those monarchs, they were originally from Navarra. And that is that the, the national government decided to donate them to uh, Navarra, where they belong to. So uh, I think it's a very pretty story, very romantic. And uh, they are very proud of them. Here you see another one, Leo Vigildo. Look at that, this is a very nice photo in here as well. Well, uh, continue with a little bit of the history of Madrid. Uh, believe it or not, right now where we are at this specific point, exactly in this crossing, this is the limit of the, look at my feet, here I am. We are just in the edge of the Arabic Madrid. This was, if you remember that, um, model I showed you at the very beginning, that uh, initial wall. So this is the corner and, and that is the opera house. Just at the other end of the opera house is where the extension of the city took place. And uh, in a 70%, all the street plans that we see around here is what it was, the city planning in that extension of the city. One Maharit was taken over by the Christian monarchs. Well, how did Madrid become the capital of Spain? Well, Spain was known as Spain up until the 1700s. Once the Habsburgs were out, they lost the crown. Very easy to remember the name of the Habsburgs monarchs. There is two Charles, Charles I and Charles II. Charles I is the grandson of the Catholic monarchs, Isabel and Fernando, okay? And Charles II was the last of the Habsburgs. He died in the year 1700. In between, there are three Philips. Philip II, Philip III, and Philip IV. So that's how easy it is. Two Charles, three Philips. The three Philips are in between the two Charles. Charles I, when he arrived to Spain, he just got in the north of Spain, uh, very close to Asturias, where the Visigoths started, started uh, conquering back all the land, uh, you know, gained by the Arabs. And uh, he just got to uh, the royal palace here, the Alcázar, but he went to Toledo. Toledo is only one hour by car south of Madrid, southwest. And even, even today, Toledo is the second most important city in the Catholic world besides the Vatican City. That's right, just in case somebody was thinking about it. Okay, so <clears throat> what happened was that uh, uh, Charles I was extremely, extremely religious and he led the church to be involved in the political affairs. He retired 
he ordered the construction of a monastery in the west of Spain in a city called Yuste, Y-U-S-T-E, and he retired over there. His son, Philip II, he was also very Catholic, but he was also a very good politician. So what happened with him? He wanted to move away from Toledo without upsetting the church, okay? Let's make a brief period here. This is a place that is a memorial to Diego de Velázquez, his birth year and the year he passed away. His remains have never been found and uh, Velázquez is supposed to be the master of all masterpieces in painting, which is Las Meninas held here in the Prada Museum in Madrid. So if you come over, that is a must that you have to, to see. And uh, supposed to be here, there have been some excavations around. It used to be a church with a little cloister and that was supposed to be the place where he was buried, but he has never ever been found any remains of him. Besides that, just I'm taking as a reference this memorial to our master. Let's do a anti-clockwise uh, panel because I believe these buildings are absolutely beautiful. And this is the original planning of the 1200s. So these streets, although they look very narrow today, in those years, they were considered like the Fifth Avenue of the time. Let's imagine, okay? So look at all this and look what we have behind us, the Royal Palace and the patio that we saw from the other point of view. And this is a modern building that it was built like about 15 years ago. Uh, but hey, I don't mind, I wouldn't mind living here in this area. Anyway, uh, look, we are in the Royal Palace over here, but look behind me. The memorial to Velazquez is right, is to my right right now. In this, uh, I'm looking at it. But can you see that street over there? That street, street was made in purpose. That was in purpose because the, they wanted to make a connection when Philip II moved from Toledo to Madrid. What was the purpose of that moving? I'm gonna let you know in a moment. Let's continue. I don't know if you can hear the bells from the distance of the cathedral, but uh, you know, it's, it's initially, initially quiet today here. But hey, much better. I enjoy this very, very, very much. Anyway, so as you see, that is that uh, uh, diagonal street. When Philip II moved the capitality from Toledo to Madrid, it was a matter of a coincidence that uh, Spanish troops, uh, they were constantly in war in Central Europe just to gain territories or not losing territories. Uh, there was a war of San Quentin and the Spanish Armada won that war. And uh, just to commemorate that victory, Philip II, ordered the construction of a monastery northwest of Madrid called St. Lawrence of the Escorial. And uh, just with the excuse of supervising those works, he decided to move the capitality from Toledo to Madrid. That's how Madrid became in 1561, the capital of the nation. And I just wanna show you something here, very interesting and probably very unexpected to most of you and including you, Sarah, which is this. Look at that. Look at this sign that we have here. Do you recognize that? Let me do a zoom. Camino de Santiago, the way, the road to Santiago. So if you go to the right, that is going to Santiago. If you go to the left, you go to Eucles, U-C-L-E-S. What is Eucles? I'll let you know in a minute. Obviously, this is the square dedicated to St. James. There you are. So, Eucles. Eucles was declared by uh, Philip II, precisely, the um, main archive of the Castilian Way to the uh, to St. James Church, where he's buried. And uh, of course, if this is the way, following the, the direction of the arrow we saw in the corner of that church, which is also the church of Santiago, St. James, what well, is supposed to be the name of the street? And you see, Calle de Santiago, with the shells, the pilgrimage, pilgrimage shell, 
and also the cross of Santiago. So this street, it was the one, is the one that I mentioned to you that it was in the original plans to connect the Royal Palace on a direct line to the main square. Later on, those buildings that we have over there, they appeared and they broke the original plan. But remember the walls I mentioned of the 1200s? Those had to be knocked down. And when Philip II moved to Madrid and all the court and all the nobility came over here, Madrid needed an extension. That was like building a new city and uh, living, you know, behind the city of Toledo. In a way, it, I, and this is a very personal opinion. Every time I go to Toledo, I keep thinking, oh my God, what would happen to this beautiful town if it was still the capital of Spain? It probably would not be what it is today because Toledo was kind of abandoned. All the money that it was flowing in Toledo uh, because of the royalty just was left behind and they moved in here. That's why nowadays we can admire the city of Toledo exactly the same way it was at the end of the 1500s when everybody moved around here. So as I said, this block appeared like about a couple of centuries after, which broke the diagonality to connect with the uh, main square. Why the main square? Didn't Madrid have a main square? Well, actually he did have some squares inside of the 1200s uh, city walls, but not what we're going to see right now. Before, you see, it's in diagonal, the entrance of the square from here. But I'm just gonna take the liberty to take a little detour in here and show you something which has become a foodist paradise, okay? Uh, you're going to forgive me, I'm not going to get into it because First is uh, the signal inside is very weak and the structure is in iron, so uh, it can break. But from the outside, we can see and uh, what has become today. It's a traditional market. It has become one of those food courts that you can buy food from anywhere in Spain and also some other countries as well. And uh, right in the center of the food court, you have like tables that you can find a spot just to sit and drink and eat whatever you want to buy. They have mini baguettes, mini rolls, mini burgers. Uh, there you have uh, the paella pans, of course. <laughs> there you see how come there is no paella in a place like that, you know? And uh, here you see, look at the big T-bone steaks that they have. And Sarah, I know you love this my beautiful and desired jamones. Look at them. <laughs> Here they are. So you buy them by weight, okay? They also have these uh, sachets that they are vacuum sealed and um, uh, it can last, uh, you know, for a little while. Those sachets, as I see from here, uh, you see that uh, sign, it says 60 euros. That is for a hundred grams. That is a quarter of a pound, uh, less than a quarter of a pound. So imagine how expensive they are, those, uh, those uh, jamones. And the most expensive ones are those, as you can see here, that the hoops are black. That is an endemic race of uh, pigs that they are called Iberian pigs, okay? This other one, we have this uh, fruit. And this is uh, the only, uh, wait a minute, the only um, stand that uh, has uh, remained in this place as a real food, uh, place where you can buy some fruits and vegetables. Look at how beautiful and historic and also how nicely decorated it is. Okay, so this is the market of San Miguel, San Michael's market. And this wall that we see going down, this is the outer part of the main square. Well, let me just get back to our original route, which is just there, just only a few steps away. So, uh, I mean, uh, logistically, on the left-hand side, what I'm going to point out on a straight line is the Santiago, St. James Street, that it comes, used to come on a straight line in that direction from the Royal Palace to connect with this arch behind me, as you see, which is not perpendicular, this one. This one is in diagonal precisely to be aligned to that street. Well, 
Let's go into the main square. We, oops, that's not me. That's not, well, it's me, but it's not what I wanted to show. There you go. <laughs> Here we are. <coughs> All right. So, uh, you know, uh, when I started doing my regular uh, virtual tours from here, I was so happy that some of these little shops, they have to buy the pandemic. Look at this little tiny hole in the wall. It's one of those shops that have been here for generations and they sell a little bit of everything from uh, a can of Coke up to um, Queen's jelly, which is very popular, especially here in the area of Castilla. We have this uh, mini bottle of uh, Tempranillo Rioja wine for 290. But also the speciality of these places are the paprika, yeah, you see. And as you see the prices in here, the paprika, the Spanish paprika is considered uh, one of the best uh, in the world as well. So that is about three ounces in weight and it's 240 euros. And the saffron, one gram of saffron, five euros. And uh, to me, that is a little bit overpriced, but hey, just for the sake of uh, supporting small businesses, I don't mind spending one euro extra if it cost me to buy it here rather than any other shop in a big chain, you see? So I remember the first time when I went to the United States and I had to book a paella for my host. And she said, do you mind cooking a paella for my friends over here? I said, sure, let's go buy the ingredients. And when I paid, and that was like about 12 years ago, $25 for a quarter of a gram, I nearly cried. Actually, I think I did cry. <laughs> and uh, well, and uh, Spanish saffron is absolutely fantastic and uh, good quality compared also with Iranian. Uh, let's, I'm going to show you another speciality. Sara, uh, from your days in Madrid, uh, when you were here, the only time that you were here, didn't you eat one of these calamari sandwiches, which is the... I don't think I did, actually. Nope. <laughs> really well i mean that you then you haven't been in madrid they said that you've been in madrid that you haven't eaten one of these you haven't been in madrid so it's called bocadillo de calamares and it's like this is like a, a my hand sized baguette okay and they just open it and they fill it up with uh, uh deep fried calamari rings just in flour no butter just flour and deep fried in uh, olive oil and uh, I have to tell you, 340 for one of those together with a small beer, that is uh, like a, almost a full meal. This is literally what you see, a hole in the wall. And this place, this sells an average of half a ton of calamari rings per day. So imagine how popular the place is. It's totally, uh, I mean, this is the silly time of the day. You know, it's not 7 p.m. yet. Uh, in Spain, our meal times are very, very different to what it is in the rest of the world. And here we are now in Plaza Mayor. Look at this. I'm going to do a full panel clockwise. Well, this was a consequence of uh, the monarchy moving from Toledo to Madrid. And it was also a monetary issue. Okay. The name of this square was Plaza del Arrabal. Arrabal. What a word. A-R-R-A-B-A-L. Arrabal means the outskirts. And in old Spanish, plaza, plaza means what it means today, plaza, an open space like this. Plaza means market. So let's get back to the walls of the 1200s. That it was just outside of this square. So when they made that arch to get in here, just use your imagination and just at the other arch it used to be another arch which was the wall of the city you know and an entrance to the city and over here it was the outside of the city this was an empty space as i said let's use our Im imagination no buildings around here at all okay so this was the market square plaza market arrabal outskirts plaza del arrabal why the market in this square? Very easy and very simple, the solution. If the merchants, they were selling their goods outside of the city, they did not have to pay taxes. So when Philip II came over and he heard the construction of a new city, he said, uh -uh, we have to uh, do something about it. And they did, certainly they did. I mentioned earlier that uh, moving 
places from one place to another, in those days, the sense of distance is not the same as now. Uh, if you forgot to buy a loaf of bread nowadays, you jump in the car, go to the nearest market and uh, buy a loaf of bread. But, uh, you know, just moving the market like another half a mile away behind us, it was just a kind of a hassle. So it forced, in a way, having all this constructed that it was inaugurated, by the way, in the early 1600s with his son, Philip III. Uh, they, I mean, the, the merchants here, they had no choice but hiring the premises and the ground floor. This house I have here on the right-hand side, this was the very first business that was opened here in the square. This was the Royal Bakery House. The frescoes have been recently restored, as you see. A few years later, after the bakery was opened, because it was, uh, it was called the Royal Bakery, because uh, they were serving to the royalty. And uh, a few years later in this square, some things happened that make or made the monarchy to take over this building. So these were royal dependencies. Let's just have a look at the monarch who did all that. Philip III, the son of Philip II. By the way, Sarah, have you ever realized that uh, when Spain wasn't called Spain, was the crown of Castilla, uh, he, the, the monarch, Philip II, um, he sponsored several expeditions and, you know, with the Invisible Armada, etc., etc. And they, uh, those were the ones who sponsored the very first uh, circumnavigation of the world. The Philippine Islands, when they were conquered by the Spanish Armada, they were named after that monarch, Philip, Philippine, you see? And uh, his son, Philip III, this statue was given to him by the Duke of Florence as a personal uh, present because they were personal friends. Uh, it's been here since then, since it was given to him. So he was the one who witnessed many of the things that happened in this uh, square. Um, as I have mentioned many times, you know, every country has uh, the dark side of the history or the B side of the history. Let's put it nicely <laughs> that way. In this square, uh, the trials of the Inquisitions were held. So, you know, I'm not proud of it. It's part of the history and it happened and it happened. What can I say? Uh, but uh, the trials were made in here and they were made public and the monarchs and especially Philip III and also Philip IV, his son, uh, they have to come over here. And in this uh, house, I told you earlier, uh, is where they witnessed everything. They had to be witnessing. Also, the old style uh, bull rings were held in here. Also executions and <laughs> monarchs proclamations were also held in this square. So we have jumped from nobody knows when Madrid was taken uh, by the Arabs on those walls made out of fire, remember, uh, to the Madrid of the Habsburgs. And um, not far from here, actually, there is a building just behind me. Just let me see if we can see from here the tower. Yes, can you see that tower over there? That is a church. That is the church of the Holy Cross. Next door to the church of the Holy Cross right now is the headquarters of the uh, Foreign Affairs uh, Ministry. But that was the Royal Jail where those people sentenced in this square, they were held in there in those days to be taken away of the city, to be burned alive. That was you know, and what an irony that now is the foreign affairs headquarters, and in those days used to be the uh, royal jail. And uh, just to say goodbye to all of you, I just want to point out at this little business in here, which is the oldest business opened in this square. This is the fifth generation, and they sell hats. They've been open since 19, uh, sorry, 1894. They did not close, but even in the Civil War, uh, they have survived the pandemic and uh, any kind of uh, hat that you might think of, uh, they sell them here, including the touristy ones that you see. And uh, you have the Basque uh, bonnets, also the French bonnets, they are here. And this is the typical Madrileño hat, all right? So uh, you see a little bit more like this with a very, very short visor and the uh, fancy hats. We have this typical Spanish sombrero over here. We have the Panama hats as well, ladies and gents uh, gear. We have also the Burma, the typical Australian hats, uh, you know, there you see. And Sarah, can you tell me what is that? 
Oh, that's the Toreador hat, right? Uh, that's right. That's the Matador hat. Here you see. And this is a touristy one. It's not a good quality, but look at even that. Look at the price, 153 euros. You see? So there you see. Also, we have the top hat in here, the fancy. Uh, look at that. I love that one. You know, it's a ladies' uh, hat as well. And we have uh, all this uh, all good quality, I have to tell you. All good quality. And uh, just talking about the the Basque bonnet that we have in me here. This is the brand that you need to look for, Elosegui. I have one of them since at least 30 years ago and uh, still just in pristine conditions. And uh, well, just uh, one last thing just to say, uh, to show you, look at the name of the, what used to be the square, Arrabal, which is an Arabic word meaning the outskirts and a full panel of the entire square is going around here. Uh, loads of cafes. Don't get me wrong when, I'm, when you hear what I'm going to say now. Wherever you are in any uh, touristy city in, in Europe, uh, call it France, uh, London, uh, Venice, Rome, uh, here in Madrid, uh, main squares for me is not a place to eat. For me, it's a place because you're not paying for the drink. They're overpriced. Okay, it doesn't matter where you are. And uh, Sarah, I know that you love some Marks Square. Uh, you pay a little fortune for a drink or a coffee, but you're playing. You're paying for the place. So whatever the place, just to sit over here and watch people and see. Look at the way that person is dressed. You know. Uh, oh my goodness, he's wearing sandals with socks. Must be German. You know, just criticizing all that is, is a good place for gossiping and, and uh, you know, just uh, people watch is one of my favorite spots, sports. So, well, Sarah, what can I say here? Do you have any questions? Anybody has any questions? Well, I don't think a lot, I have a lot of questions, but this has been so nice. I feel like I've just been on a little mini vacation with you. <laughs> but remind me, is this, I, I've seen this square before. Um, was this yeah. where they had the Christmas market? Correct. Yes. Okay. This is where they have the Christmas markets. And a little curiosity about the Christmas market, not even the pandemic stopped it, only the Civil War for one year. And it was in the Christmas from 1938 to 39, uh, just uh, four months before the war ended, uh, because Madrid was heavily sieged and bombed at the time. So that was the only year for 151 years in a row that they didn't make the Christmas market, but every single year it's been held in this square. And you're right, good memory. This is where- Yeah, no, I remember we did, yeah. we did that together for Christmas uh, last year. Yeah, or that's right, that's yeah. right. Yeah, that's I'm right, wise. yeah. Well, it has been well, a joy course. to walk with you through Madrid. I really appreciate this, Jorge, how fun this has been. So uh, we're gonna do it again. We're gonna have another walking tour, but the next one you're gonna do on Thursday will be modern Madrid, is that correct? That will be modern Madrid, that's correct. And it's nothing to do with this, no history, because it used to be nothing. It's just, uh, it was developed in the, in the last uh, 50 years, the most, you know, but uh, it's gonna be a totally different scenario. You're gonna think that it's not Madrid, but it is Madrid, yeah. So different. Fantastic. And Sa Sarah, thank you so much. What can I say? Uh, you're you very, very most generous welcome, doing Jorge. this. <laughs> okay, it's so I was, go okay. ahead, please. Oh, I was just going to say, it's always great to uh, help out and ha and host another gu a guide collective member because you guys are such gems. So Thank I appreciate you, so you much. sticking around and uh, following me down a crazy path. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure, Sarah, whenever you need me. We'll see each other again tomorrow. Cooking, right? Cooking, yes. So please join yeah. us again here uh, as we celebrate Spain this week on Adventures with Sarah. We're going to cook tomorrow uh, and that'll be at noon Pacific time. So uh, we'll be cooking together. I'm looking forward to making some lunch with you. I'll see you then. Okay. I'll see All you right. then. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.